Greetings, Guardians. My name is Bife here. Oh, ah. oh, sorry. Now that every Guardian, myself included, uh, who has ever done the Light Blade on uh, Grandmaster and has done Ghosts of the Deep Solo, uh, still haven't got to that, uh, yeah, everyone has nightmares again. So let's explain those nightmares and let's talk about what the moths actually are. Now, moths have been around the Hive since the days of Destiny 1, but they really only came to true prominence back in the days of the Witch Queen, Savathun even taking on a kind of moth-like aesthetic herself. Moth people concept art has existed in Destiny 1 since, well, way back when, but I think these little critters and Savathun are the closest we ever actually got to it. So today, I wanted to jump in and properly talk about them and explain what's going on with them and why it's so fitting that now we have the ability to wield Hive Moths this season. So, the first time anyone saw Hive Moths, to the best of my knowledge, was in Golgoroth's cellar in the time of the Taken King. This was a part of the King's Fall raid, and back in the day you would find those moths floating around in the darkness without much purpose as it seems, although they might have been a bit of an indication. It should be stated here and now that I think these moths are not the same as the Lucent moths that we see in Savathun's throne world, but I think the relation to them is something that could be speculated on just a little bit, if one can't truly confirm it all. Regardless, there are a few less obvious places in D1 where we do find mention of these moths. First of all, there's the rare blue quality hunter artifact known as the Light of Moths, which has the flavor text, in the hive's ontoformic reality, this glow is the manifestation of bound dying souls. Quick note on that ontoformic reality. Ontoformic is not technically a word, but I believe this is meant to say that it manifests purely because of their thought and will. Not totally sure if that's me getting it correct, but the point being, the moths are meant to be a manifestation of bound dying souls. Or at least the glow is meant to be the manifestation. The moths seem to surround it, and it is called Light of Moths, so, you know, maybe it's all connected. Additionally, when you enter the Dreadnought in the Taken King campaign for the first time, you can actually wander off the path, and if you do so, you stumble across a hive worm or two. When you do this, you get a chance to scan it, and the scan will yield the ghost, giving the following line. According to the world's grave, the hive ingest these worms, not for sustenance, but survival. Spores, moths, and worms. All things Earth's ancestors believed grew from the dead. Just a thought. So all of this D1 information is pretty scant, but from what we can take of it, it gives us a potentially interesting picture. Golgoroth's cellar was a place where Oryx stockpiled light. Keep in mind that this is deep within the Dreadnought, his throne world. If the moths are here, then we can use the Light of the Moths artifact to speculate that they're bound to dying souls. Perhaps the same souls as whoever possessed the light that Oryx now stores, like a fine wine within those cellars to be decanted at his convenience. Keep in mind, as the speaker once said, the light lives in all things, all places. And that's to imply that it doesn't just belong to Guardians, it can indeed dwell within all living things. So everything above is very speculative, it's very old, the grimoire on it is not even too dense, there's a lot that we don't know about those old D1 moths. And the reality is, yeah, they could be completely different from the ones that we find in the Witch Queen, but I figured that it was worth taking a look at them and just investigating them briefly. Now though we can look ahead and we can more definitively look at Savathun's moths and the moths that we find in Witch Queen. The first time we see these moths is when we step aboard Savathun's flagship, the Lure, and when we do so the ghost makes the following commentary on the moths. Did you see that moth just now? It was glowing with light. Not corrupted light, Guardian, but light like ours. The ghost comments here that the light within the moth is not corrupted and is in fact pure like our own that darkness hasn't twisted it, but it seems to be more natural. This, of course, is a hint to the later things that we see in the campaign, which is that the Light seemingly chose Savathun and chose the Hive Guardians. It may also be relevant later, so keep it in mind. There's also this little observation here, which I think is probably the most obvious thing of all. Those moths will attack if you don't shoot them, Guardian. So yeah, as if it wasn't obvious enough, this shows that the moths hold some kind of allegiance to the hive specifically. However, the difference maker is probably that they're filled with light. This is what differentiates them from the moths that we might have found in Oryx's throne world, which might be manifested, but might not necessarily be active, if that makes sense. 
The moths in Savathun's throne world feel active. They work around the place. They will actively try and aid the hive in battle. Whereas the moths in Golgoroth's cellar are kind of passive. They're like a sign of death, probably signaling to the dark aligned hive that all of this is as it should be, and that the souls that were sacrificed in the name of the sword logic did indeed contain the light and were indeed weak. You know, maybe this is just one of those signs of how the hive are, and the moths manifest around according to what the hive are doing. Here in the light, the moths perhaps represent something that is, again, more active, and in that process is trying to aid the hive because now they are creatures of the light, it's not subdued by darkness. However, here in the light, if the moths do also represent the same thing that they did in D1, with their light representing bound dying souls, it means that there's going to be a lot more questions to ask, because why then would they be taking an active part in the process alongside the hive? Why would they seemingly aid them? So yeah, that's worth considering, and it's why I don't necessarily know if the moths that we found in D1 are quite linked to the ones that we find in Witch Queen. But do remember, however, the one thing we absolutely know is that these moths are working alongside the hive. That is going to be a relevant part as we explore the nature of these moths a little later. Our next little bit of intelligence on the moths comes from the Lucent Tales lore book. It contains the tales of hive ghosts and their newly risen hive light bearers. Of particular interest to us are the entries entitled Krill and Spectre. I think in order to get the best understanding of Krill's lore entry, you need to first read the somewhat less important entry of Spectre. It essentially shows us that the whole of Savathun's brood has been changed by her adoption of the light. Take a listen to this, and we'll unpack it in a moment. Type. Personal Investigative Report. Parties. 1. Ghost Type. Designate. Spectre. Associations. Light. Lucent Hive. Transcript follows. Post Lumination Day 017, 1023. Arrived on scene. Victim as a thrall. No identity. Cause of death. Fractured neck due to blunt force trauma. Traces of light detected. Nabenki interviewed the primary suspect. I've preferred talking to their own and don't respond to things, even things that bring them back from the dead. Overheard confession. Suspect is Knight identified as Ulrich Thalen, victim's commander. Reported that when his ghost detected light within victim, Ulrich Thalen executed him for theft. Open and shut case. Post Lumination Day 018. 1344. Three more deaths fitting same pattern. Internal artifacts of light. Victims summarily executed, but circumstances raise more questions. Thralls don't partner with ghosts, should be unable to receive or carry light. Nobenki tasked to investigate. Suspects an organized smuggling ring, potential human or fallen infiltration. Post Illumination Day 018. 1457. Encountered suspect, thrall. No identification. Classified person of interest, 7. Tests confirmed traces of light. Dembenki applied standard hive interrogation techniques, extracted confession after extended session. Person of interest, 7, admitted to stealing light, keeping it in urns. Also implicated a superior acolyte. Doesn't add up. Post Illumination Day 018. 1912. Requested time alone with suspect to establish rapport. Nabenki hesitant, doesn't like being spoken to unbidden, but acquiesces. Person of interest 7 admitted to giving false confession to end visceral hive interrogation. Claimed complete ignorance to the light's origins in his system. When asked about unusual activity, reported that his symbiote feels sated without need for bloodshed or tithing. Post Illumination Day 018. 1933. Consulted Nabenki for a context regarding tithing. Apparently, Hive function on a system of energetic kickbacks, paid up the ladder ending with Queen. Would have been useful to know earlier. Suspected this network may be impacted by introduction of light. Nabenki confirmed light exhibits a negative pressure within the system, maybe pushing trace amounts back through it. Have submitted theory to our commander for further investigation. Post Illumination Day 019-0630. Partner acknowledged me this morning. Established eye contact. Potential illness? Post Illumination Day 019-0742. 
On my recommendation, person of interest 7 executed for perjury. So, Spectre's report indicates that the light can be found within all the hive across Savathun's brood, down even to her thrall. Now, this in itself tells us a lot about the Lucent Brood, but why does it relate to the moths? It doesn't seem relevant when in isolation. But it appears that it may be a knock-on effect of this that has caused the moths, and that's what we can expand on in the Krill law entry, knowing that now all of the hive, not just the guardians within Savathun's brood, but every hive is experiencing some kind of interaction with the light. Take a listen to Krill's law entry and you'll start to understand a lot more about why that's relevant and why it pertains to the Lucent moths. Type. Private medical log. Parties. 1. Ghost type. Designate Krill. Associations. Light. Lucent Hive. Text decrypted. Transcript follows. Ubatuana blames me. Naturally. He insisted on naming me Krill in our first exchange because he claims I am as small and useless as the weak pests that the Hive evolved from. Cruelty and suspicion are his nature, but it makes for a poor physician. Still, poison is a logical, if ignorant, hypothesis for the condition. Patients reported various symptoms, mood swings, headaches, insomnia. Primary symptom remains the growths. I hesitate to call them tumors, no signs of metastasization. One must be precise in terminology, after all. After some clumsy exploratory surgery on my inner workings, Ubatuana seems content I am not some Trojan horse. Wouldn't that be ironic? Ghosts sent to reclaim the hive from death only to wipe them out by dispersing pathogenic specks rather than light. As I said, ignorant. Biopsied a dozen growths. No clear result. The mass is within a primitive, protoplasmic, little more than interstitial fluid and proteolytic amino acids. Primordial soup, as the humans say. No sign of infection, but curiously, the lining of these cysts, for lack of a better term, seems to be saturated with immune cells. Further biopsies will be needed. Wondrous developments. Biopsy 37 yielded aggressive results. I pierced a cyst to discover not fluid, but life. A winged arthropod attacked me, defending its host, I estimate. Little of its body remained upon destruction, but it seems to be more energy construct than flesh. I plan to take the next specimen alive for vivisection. Confirmed, the winged arthropods, despite their energy structure, also contain hive cells. I theorize hive physiology, unaccustomed to light exposure, is attempting to isolate it like an infection. Light, structured as it is, organizes the discarded sebum within and forges it into imaginal cells, kickstarting a sort of holo metabolism. Incredible. The hive's own bodies transform light into a parasite. What a wondrous adaptation. They are commending Ubatu Anna for his discovery. Thus, now I perceive the true poetry in my name. Everything about him of value comes from me. So this last passage confirms a startling revelation here. The Lucent Hive moths are a byproduct, seemingly, of the light's introduction into the hive's physiology. Granted, we can't take the entirety of this medical record to be sound and conclusive because it is just one medical record, but it is the best thing we have to work off of for the moment. And the theory does seem somewhat sound. The Hive have been in the claws of the darkness for so long that it's not unlikely that their physiology has been changed. The Hive's influence seems to transform the light universally within their bodies into cysts. Those cysts will then appear in a tumor-like formation, but will instead produce moths. Moths created by the Hive within Savathun's Lucent Brood are capable of growing into creatures within their hosts by the looks of things. These moths will then defend their hosts and even bond to new ones if the original host is destroyed based on what we can see in-game. However, these moths are subordinate and dependent upon the hive, as hosts by the looks of things. This state that they live in, as a being dependent on a symbiotic relationship, leaves them in a position where they might be able to be taken advantage of, namely by us. Being bound to the hive means that we can potentially use a fragment of their power in order to pull these moths to our side. 
Whilst I'm content in the idea that they'd never serve a being not of the light, such as Zivor Wrath, I do believe that the beginning of this season perhaps opened the way for the Moths to realize that they could serve other masters. Take a listen to this quick clip. You now wield hive magic and have entwined it with your light. I think it's this moment that really opened the way for us to discover how to wield the Moths for our own purposes. It's seemingly the case that, according to lore in the Moth Keeper's raps, a hunter took the initiative and discovered how to do this first. The Moth Keeper's raps exotic tells us how this came to be and the process required to entice a hive moth into cooperation with a vanguard aligned guardian. It's a fascinating lore tab and it reads as follows Smother the lights and run. She had tracked the infested ogre across the throne world, led by its trailing effluvium. Now it lay collapsed against a cracked jade pillar, its wheezing form obscured by a thick blanket of moths. As she approached, ripples of startling color shimmered over the ogre as the moths flashed their vibrant underwings in warning. She pulled her hood tight against her exposed face. She would have to work quickly. The moths on the ground shivered as she stepped carefully over them. She took a breath of the powdery air and reached into the rustling mass, shoulder deep, as quivering wings beat against her neck. She groped blindly until her fingers finally grazed against the withered ogre, its hide yielding as old leather. Her knife was swift and sure. The ogre shuddered once, and it was over. As she withdrew her blade, the moths took flight with the muffled rush of a thousand zephyr-born petals. Then they were upon her, covering her cloak, her shoulders, landing in her hair. They smothered her with their dusty bodies, brushing against her lips as she whispered the incantation she stole from the Witch Queen's spire. She traced the outline of a hive rune in the air with her knife, then touched the tip of the blade to the back of her hand. The moths fell still, hushed, by pectinate antennae quivering as they considered the offer. Not a host but a home. The moths, which are seemingly born of the hive, need to be communicated with, it would appear, in a manner that the hive would be able to use. The incantation used by the hunter and the rune that was stolen from the spire appear to have appealed to the moths in a different manner. They seemingly used the hive prior to this as a host, but not as their home necessarily. They fostered loyalty to the thing they lived on, because they lived there, not because they belonged there. And this creates a very interesting question about our relationship with the Lucent Moths. The Hive are the only reason they even exist. Without the cysts that birthed them, the Moths wouldn't be a factor at all. They wouldn't exist. But as it stands, it may be the case that this lack of true belonging for the Moths, the fact that their birthing is literally a result of the Hive's physiology rejecting them, leads them into a strange situation where they're not truly at home with the hosts that bring them to life. Instead, they might be more at home with us, guardians, whose physiology has accepted the light fully and who have used it more frequently. With all this, one must once again consider the nature of the Lucent Moths, though. The one persistent question that it brings up is this. Are these Lucent Moths that were created within the hive of Savathun's brood the same as the ones that we'd get within Golgoroth Cellar in terms of this simple prospect. Are they also manifestations of souls that are both dying and bound? And if so, whose souls are they? We know that the light supposedly came from all of the other hive and was rejected by the hive's physiology. Again, it's a long chain of assumptions given that we don't know the medical report to be completely true, but if all of it is for just a second, what does that mean about where this light comes from? Is this something that has come directly from Savathun herself? Is this light that's come from another place, and is it something that one should consider when wielding the moths? Is it something that has arisen because of Savathun's experiments? Is it perhaps light that has found its way into this place because of something else that has died? That answer is not necessarily clear. It seems as though it's bound to the Witch Queen, but the reality is it's not entirely clear no matter what. We'd need true confirmation to understand what's going on there. 
The energetic kickbacks imply that this might start with the Hive Guardians and Savathun, but even that is not truly confirmable. If we also learned one thing from Shadowkeep, it's that this isn't the first time that the Hive have experimented with arthropods quite like this. I think we should also take into account the idea that the Hive have experimented with swapping souls and psyches too. Let me give you the two examples in question, which is the Inquisition of the Damned and Xenophage. Xenophage is the perfect example of the Hive using arthropods to experiment on. Omar Agar's light was stripped away from him by the heart of Crota, and yet he and his psyche and his light were seemingly forced into an arthropod of sorts. That arthropod now sits at the very heart of the Xenophage exotic, something that is truly powerful and represents his fury as well as his solar light. The other thing to note is the Inquisition of the Damned, who show that the Hive are able to control one's psyche and soul and exchange it from form to form. This is shown by the three Hive siblings at the center of the Inquisition of the Damned book, who in a rather gruesome ritual swapped bodies and souls in quite a few different manners and showed off some of their dire intent, with one of them going on to slaughter the majority of Crota's remaining brood, but for Hash Ladun and her three sisters. This is something which shows that mastery of Hive magic, which has allowed them to take souls and place them in other vessels, be they other Hive, or even other creatures entirely. So maybe the same thing has happened with these Lucent Moths in a strange way, or with the Moths in Golgoroth's cellar, Maybe all of this is a natural process that the Hive's physiology creates as a result. All of this is unclear, there's a lot of speculation to be had here, and one medical report and a bunch of my own musings is not going to give us all the answers. But I think it is very clear that the Hive moths that we see in dwelling within Savathun's brood have something a little bit more. Consciousness. The moths sit and consider the offer of the Guardian in the Mothkeeper Wraps exotic, and that's important because it shows that they had the ability to choose. That in itself is a remarkable breakthrough in knowledge, because it shows us that underneath all of those different moths, there is the ability to choose to serve. A consciousness, an intelligence, that maybe guardians can tap into. The moths are alive, we know this much, and whilst generally they serve the hive, Maybe it's the case that we can coax more of them over to change their loyalties and find a new home with us in a more cooperative light. That's all from me for now though. I hope you enjoyed the video and if you did, go ahead and leave a like and let me know what you thought down below in the comments section. The moth lore is really open-ended. We do get some vague ideas, but again, none of it is truly confirmable because whilst the doctoral records that we get out of Krill are somewhat detailed, we don't know enough to say that it's all true. And also, Krill admits in that particular passage that they don't actually know too much about the Hive's own physiology, they don't understand enough about Hive culture, so all of the perspectives we get here are somewhat incomplete. I'd be fascinated to know what you all think though, so again, leave that down below in the comments. Of course, if you want more Destiny content, go ahead and hit subscribe and the bell next to subscribe to turn on those email notifications. But as per usual, know that your viewership, as always, is quite enough for me. And that in the meantime, my name has been, my name is Bife. Rodasia Arastra. I'll see you, Starside.